the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, Japanese Surplus Bomber, Squad Mates, Testing the Test Site, and Metal Beasts, Norwegian H.E. Deity. The second fall update of this year is just around the corner. And before you start pacing around and checking the calendar, we'd like to introduce another exciting vehicle that's recently been added to War Thunder. This is one of the most advanced HE slingers in the game. It's a Norwegian version of a South Korean machine found in the Swedish tech tree, the Vidar Self-Propelled Howitzer. The name is actually an acronym for Versatile Indirect Artillery, but also the name of an ancient Norse god of vengeance, a son of Odin. Its main caliber is a 155mm howitzer, with an 8 meter long barrel and elevation angles between minus 4 and plus 70 degrees. There's also a large caliber pintle mounted machine gun. The ammo is stored in the hull sides and rear. The engine and transmission compartment is in the front, the driver sits right next to it, and four more crew members are in the turret. The Vidar has the second longest gun barrel in the game, only yielding to the Soviet Object 120. With this kind of size, the SPG can propel 40 kilogram high explosive shells to a whopping 935 meters per second. Super impressive for this caliber. Of course, it also means it has amazing ballistics, but it doesn't even matter. Because the Vidar is the first in-game vehicle of this class to be equipped with a laser rangefinder. You won't even need to make ranging shots or adjust firing trajectories. Some may think it'll make your hits less valuable, but awesome frags scored at extreme distances will make you forget any of your doubts. Along with the classic pains involved with HE slinging business, the reload is just as impressive. An ace crew can place a fresh shell from the first stage every six seconds and still keep up a decent firing rate of six shots a minute once it's empty. Besides, you don't even need to use your main caliber on lightly armored vehicles. There's a large caliber machine gun on the roof for those. The 1000 horsepower engine can provide a mobility level comparable to early MBTs, so you won't experience any issues with positioning either. If the battle's getting too hot and your enemy seems unstoppable, the Vidar can perform a quick retreat without cumbersome maneuvers. What it could use, though, is some smoke launchers. As for the size and armor, well, those aren't the strong sides for this vehicle. Of course, with a large internal space, one can hope that an enemy round might pass through with no damage, but you still shouldn't shine in enemy sights when you can avoid it. With some caution, the Vidar has all the chances to become the most efficient HE slinger in War Thunder. We have one odd story for you today, and we'd like to try and find a rational explanation for it. The first prototype of the Japanese Kawasaki Ki-48 bomber took off in September of 1939, right when the Second World War began in Europe. At the time, the Japanese air forces already had a similar bomber with less speed but more load, the Mitsubishi Ki-21. Moreover, there was an ongoing competition for a replacement, the Nakajima Ki-49. So why did they also make the 48? Maybe it was the traditional show of respect type of thing for the Kawasaki company, like had happened with the Ki-10 fighter and the Ki-32 bomber. In short, competitors simply quit the competition to give Kawasaki a chance to score a production order. But no, that wasn't the case. Takeo Doi, chief aircraft designer at Kawasaki, was almost driven insane trying to work on two fighters at once, the Ki-45 and the Ki-61. There was another project as well, the Transport Ki-56, which was basically a localized copy of the famous American Lockheed Electra. So about that show of respect and donating an order part, passing a task to create a tactical bomber, which was also based on the Ki-45, a fighter that didn't even exist at the moment, would in no way be a noble gesture. According to official sources, when the Japanese Air Forces first encountered the SB bomber, 
they were so impressed that they wanted to get a similar thing as soon as possible. So that's how the Ki-48 was created? But that doesn't sound right either. The Japanese army first met the fast bomber in the summer of 39, when the Ki-48 was almost ready. Prior to that, only the Japanese naval air forces in China saw some. In any case, the Ki-21 was just as good as the SB, and the upcoming replacement Ki-49 was even better. So again, why did they need the Ki-48? The answer to this might lie outside of the rational plane. It had nothing to do with tactics, strategy, or economics. It was some good old panic that often leads to middling, rash solutions. It wasn't the specs of the SB that impressed the Japanese military so much, it was the results. On February 23, 1938, a single raid on the island of Taiwan wiped out three years worth of fuel supply and multiple combat aircraft, including some brand new imported ones. The military was terrified. Expensive naval long-range bombers were burning in the Chinese skies by the squadron. And when the Army Ki-21 met the I-16 with their rockets in Mongolia, the Ki-48 was already on its way to its first flight, despite reason. The Army desperately needed bombers, so the command was looking for any chance to increase their production in the shortest time possible, even if it meant reducing their performance. Neither Mitsubishi nor Nakajima could promise fast results. The Ki-45, however, was already in development. So what if it was a fighter? They could make a twin project and rework it. Takeo Doi and his team tried to explain that bomber projects didn't work that way, but no one ever heard their opinion. The results were quite predictable. Before the top brass realized that the Ki-48 was outdated only a couple years after production began, the factories managed to pump out almost 2,000 of them. Of course, it had fighter-like maneuverability, but that's probably the only advantage this aircraft ever had. The rest of its performance numbers were more fit to be included into the list of flaws. By the summer of 1944, the Ki-48 was exclusively used for special attack units and as flying labs for testing new weapons. Chances are most people in the Japanese air forces knew perfectly well they could go without these machines, but what could they do at the time? It just happened that way. Our squad mates still have some ground maps to study in War Thunder. Today they're going to show you major firing lines, key positions, and of course winning tactics for Test Site 2271. Since this map is almost symmetrical, both teams can share the tactics, so we'll talk about the southern one only. In Scenario 1, both squad mates spawn at the eastern point and head straight to the hangar in squares F7 and F8. They circle the building and move north in parallel, catching enemy vehicles in crossfire. Having reached the enemy part of the flank, the players turn west and approach the rear area of point C. As they're busy capping the point, the enemy won't expect an attack from behind, so focus on the possible reinforcements from the north, where the enemy spawn point is located. After clearing the area, one player moves to capture, while the other one covers them from a safe position next to the hangar wall. The next wise move would be to push the front line to the enemy side of the map, along the border between lines D and C, and leave the capture area in the rear. Using the corners of the hangars, the tankers hold off the enemy advance while the allies move in. Once the flanks are stabilized, the squad moves to the urban area. The tankers move to the central point the same way they've just done it in the eastern part of the map. By heading the enemy rear, they take control over point B and hide in the buildings in squares C4 and B4. This place gives them firing lines at both the eastern and the western parts of the map. Scenario 2 begins in the west. Priority number one here is to achieve control over the cross-country area. After spawn, the squad mates split up and head north along opposite sides of the cross-country range. Point A is located in a depression, so the team needs to control the heights along lines 1 and 3 if they want to capture it. The tankers move in parallel and vice the range, destroying enemy machines with crossfire. The advance pauses for the capture, and resumes again to move the front line further north. The next step is to consolidate in the center of the map. 
One player enters the town along line D, while the other one moves deeper into enemy territory and positions themselves in the familiar buildings in squares C4 and B4. Further action will depend on the situation. They can either hold the defense like in the previous scenario, or move along the border between lines C and D, supporting allies in the center and the industrial area. What are your impressions of the new map? Any favorite positions or tactical ideas? Share them in the comments. Meanwhile, it's time for us to answer some of the questions you left under previous episodes. The first question was sent by a player called Lost Affinity. What's the best close air support fighter near the 7.0 battle rating? High Affinity. There's quite a number of good strike aircraft at this BR, including those that can perform as fighters. For instance, the American F-8F 1B and F-3D, some modifications of the German ME-262, the British Spitfire F Mark 24 and Attacker, the Japanese Kika, or the Swedish A-21. Josh McCallab asks, which Vauteurs are better at air-to-air -air combat? The French Vauteurs with their manual and radar-guided missiles, or the Israeli Vauteurs with their heat seekers? Hey Josh, the French Vauteurs armament is better for frontal attacks, while the Israeli one is better for chasing. They have similar levels of efficiency. Another question comes from Anakin La Chocolatine. Why are Japanese planes carrying torpedoes slightly on the right or the left of the fuselage? Hello there, Anakin. Prop planes can sometimes offset weaponry to compensate for the propeller torque reaction. Dodo Dog writes, should the APF SDS be spinning in the intro? Hi there. Yes, APF SDS rounds spin a little due to the shape of the fins. It's not meant for stabilization, by the way. The spin compensates for the inevitable imperfections in the shell itself. And the last comment for today was written by Joshua Lee Spiney. Is it possible for an air-to-air -air missile to damage a ground target? Hello, Joshua. Yes, in theory, but you'll need to find a way to achieve a hit. For instance, SAMs with infrared homing devices that are similar to aircraft ones can lock onto an airborne target and quickly switch to a ground vehicle. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to pray to Thor before battle for a firepower buff. Leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.